Okay, so as uh, attendees are, are coming into the space, um, I want to just say welcome back. You know, we've been um, doing the Where We Are Now webinars for, gosh, Heather, what, since March? March. Since March, and um, originally doing them once a week, and now we've moved to a more monthly schedule. Um, but I'm always excited to be back and, and, and doing them again and checking in and seeing what's going on. So I just want to welcome everybody who's joining us today. Um, and that sort of, you know, brings me to my panel. Um, I want to start with Clarissa Garrett. Clarissa is a senior content producer at 72 and Sunny. She started her path at Team One um, advertising um, at Team One Advertising, producing beautiful content for Lexus. After a time freelancing, she landed at Media Arts Lab on Apple in, a con intensive, in an intensively creative agency. She helped launch um, the iPad and was one of the senior producers for the award-winning Shot on iPhone World Gallery campaign. After a few years of producing great work for Honda, Clarissa is now at 72 and sunny, making work with an entire with extremely talented people. In her free time, she can be found with her two beautiful children or singing jazz soul in the LA area. I have to confess that I snuck a peek at that and she's fantastic. She's amazing. Uh, Thanks. Oh gosh. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I saw it on the Think LA website last night. I was like, wow, okay. Um, so uh, next up is Sabrina Olivia. Oh, Olivia, I'm saying that correctly, Sabrina? Uh, Oliva. Oliva, um, and she's a senior art producer at FCB Health New York. Sabrina has been on staff with FCB Health for the last two years and has over 20 years of experience as both freelance and staff art producer with agencies including Saatchi and Saatchi, Publicis, Gray, and clients including L'Oreal, CoverGirl, Cadillac, and many, many more. Kwame, I'm gonna do your name, but I know that it's gonna be terrible, so I'm just gonna really try my best. Go for it. <laughs> okay, Kwame, Kwame D. Roche. You got it. All right. That's very <laughs> exciting for me. You have no idea. Um, so an expert in advertising and marketing uh, professional with over 25 years of experience, Kwame is a veteran creative leader with a knack for concepts that deliver on strategy and delight audiences across all media. His copy and content have launched brands, won awards, and increased revenue for clients such as Ford Motor Company, the Washington Nationals, Claritin, Welsh's Food, and NASDAQ. He began his career as a copywriter, and today he serves as the ECD of Bravely and is on the advisory board member of 600 and Rising. Next is Madison. Madison is an art producer, an art producer, Madison Becker is an art producer at Digitas, Digitas Health Philadelphia. Now a senior, senior content producer at Digitas Health um, based in Philadelphia, Madison entered the advertising game right after finishing her bachelor's degree in photography at Drexel University a little over five years ago. Since then, she's expanded her knowledge on all things art buying, photography, video, broadcast production, and has found a home within her Digitas production family. When she's not working at all hours of the day and night, she's probably <laughs> snuggling with her two rescue dogs, Blue and Stevie, and drinking her fifth or seventh coffee of the day. I love that. So then, uh, last but not least, Heather Elder has been an agent for over 20 years. She hosts the Dear Art Producer podcast, writes a blog about the industry, and hosts a site for freelance art producers. Uh, mostly, though, she's always thinking ahead, and what better time to do that than now? I'm Heidi. I work for Workbook. I've been there for six years now, and I just get to help my clients, uh, you know, market themselves. So that's really it. Um, let's get on to our topics. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're broadcasting, you know, every month instead of every week. So it's a good idea to do some, you know, uh, do some recapping. So um, I was hoping that maybe you guys could tell me about, have you produced anything yet since, um, you know, this whole sort of pandemic started? Um, Clarissa, can I, can I go to you? Sure. I have been producing everything <laughs> for, since the pandemic started. I mean, I think if we're talking about traditional productions, we've, that has, that has slowed, um, but we have been producing commercials. We've been producing um, a lot of UGC content in the beginning of the pandemic, I'd say. There was a lot of user-generated ideas that were 
floating around the agency. I think now we are in full production on every client. And so those shoots, the way they look are remote. Um, the agency and the clients are remote. Um, we typically keep talent numbers very low and we're, we're shooting um, in and around LA. Sometimes in studios, we try to make sure there are roll up doors where it's an indoor outdoor situation and every portion of the production team has a, an area. Everyone wears PPE. Um, and although insur insurance wise, we're not covered um, against anyone getting COVID on set, I think we're doing everything we can as an agency to make sure that that doesn't happen and knock on wood, it hasn't. So um, yeah, we've been very busy. I, I, I'm very lucky to be busy at this time. Um, I think I think it depends on the kinds of clients you have. And 72, we have, you know, paps, everybody's drinking beer, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and we have clients, um, we have Pinterest, they're doing really well. Um, all the tech companies are obviously doing very well. So some of our clients, obviously we have Marriott, they're struggling, but um, I think we've been able to just keep everyone very busy on production. Sabrina, I'd love to go to you if you wouldn't mind sort of, um, you know, jumping in with a, on that question as well. Sure, um, we've been producing nonstop. Um, when we first went into lockdown, we actually, within a week, we sent drop kits um, to talent and had them um, do videos um, very quickly because um, we were ready to fly to LA for one production and obviously everything shut down. Um, from there, we've done completely no contact shoots um, where everyone is virtual. Um, we've done half and half shoots where some, t some of the team from the agency has attended um, and some are still virtual. Um, so we've been very lucky. Um, we have a lot of pharma clients and we are busier than ever. Um, and we are just, you know, every day it's, you know, we just go by with what's happening that day um, and what we can do production wise. Um, we thought, you know, at first we were looking into a lot of, um, can we do CG talent? Should we just do illustration? And we, we had a lot of vendors who, you know, were able to do that. And we did produce things like that as well. But as things, you know, slowly started opening, we've taken advantage of um, every way we can do it safely, obviously. Um, and um, it's, it's been going great. Again, knock wood, like Clarissa said, you know, safety, you know, for our crew, our agency, our client, and, you know, is, is number one. Um, so we're always doing that. But we've been busier than ever. It's been fantastic. And, and again, like Clarissa said, happy to have a job, happy to produce. And you know what, it's just, it's, you know, I hate to say it, but it is kind of exciting because we're, you know, we're learning new skills and we're learning to do things a new way. Um, so it's, it, every day is a new day. Well, I was going to say, can you expand on like, what are the new, what are the new ways? What are the new skills? You know, watching a shoot virtually is, is a completely different skill set. And I'm trying to educate my teams. Um, you know, there are some teams I find that are very open to new ways to produce and to do something completely virtually is, you know, a new way to do. How do you communicate with your crew? How do you communicate with your photographer, your wardrobe, hair and makeup? Um, doing wardrobe virtually, um, you know, doing a rack review virtually, then sending it to the talent to try on um, and to have it very organized um, to make sure that flows easily. And then as they get on set, um, you know, having them sent their hair and makeup, they've actually actually also done um, hair and makeup um, tutorials before a shoot, if the hair and makeup person is not there. Um, which is something, you know, obviously we've never done before, but even they were doing it on TV as well for the anchors and things like that. They have to learn how to do their hair and makeup. What can they do? How can we enhance it? And then they are sent, you know, their own special kit. Um, and they work virtually with the hair and makeup person to, you know, make them look their best. And it's really worked, you know, very well. So Kwame, I noticed that you were nodding during a large portion of that. <laughs> yeah, can you jump in too? Sure. Um, at Bravely, we're already a distributed model. So we, we kind of like through this whole pandemic and everything, we were doing this before it was cool. Um, I'm, I'm in DC, my, my partner and, and co-founder, he's in Jacksonville. We've got another teammate in LA and quite a few in New York. So we've all been working virtually since we started the agency a few years back. So we were kind of built for this. 
And uh, yeah, we've got two clients right now that we're working on in tandem that we're doing the exact same things that, that Clarissa and Sabrina were talking about. Uh, shooting remotely, making all those choices, uh, choosing talent, wardrobe, hair, makeup, all that stuff is happening. But what I love about it as a creative is it's forced me and my team to be more creative in how we not just get the functional bits and parts done of, of these shoots and stuff, but how do we even build the concept around, all right, if we can only have one person on camera or two people on set, how do we make that work? And, and case in point is some of the videos we launched just this week for uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars, who, you know, as an NFL team, they were, they were kind of back and forth up until about a week ago as to whether or not the season was going to start, whether or not fans were going to be there, how that's all going to work. So we took their broadcast team, um, Eric and, and Ashlyn, and we created a series of videos about them working from home as well. So the whole setup is it's the two of them and the team's mascot because we couldn't have access to any of the team members um, living in a house together. So they're sitting there getting their morning coffee and when she gets shot in the head with a t-shirt cannon and the mascot's like hiding behind the fridge. It's like that kind of thing. And so the mascot with his head on, you know, that was essentially wearing a mask and he was kind of separated and she was in the room and they shot it with as little equipment as possible. And we were able to get in one day um, eight different bits that we did and then we put them together as you know, 15 second spots. And then we have a big 60 second spot at the end where we kind of did a super cut. And that was all done in a day and a half, which would have been unthinkable before, before all this happened. But we had to get creative and smart and figure out how do we make it funny? How do we make it enjoyable? How do we lean into the pandemic? And how do we make it all work and look like it's, you know, polished and produced and we were able to pull it off. And that made me as happy as sitting back and laughing at the spots in the first place. Right. I'd love for uh, Madison, if you wouldn't mind weighing in here too. Um, how about you? Are you producing? Are you, um, can you, you know, maybe speak to that? Yeah, I mean, just to echo what Clarissa and uh, pretty much everyone said, has said, we've been producing the whole time. Uh, it, it obviously has changed in a lot of the ways that Sabrina has covered and Clar Clarissa mentioned. And I think um, one of the things that is very new to us is we're healthcare, we work with real patients a lot. And so we're not trying to hide the fact that this is all remote, um, but it's been really interesting to coach these real families who really, you know, they have no production or film experience or anything, but coaching these real people via Zoom on how to produce our shoot for us. They're shooting it for us. They're, you know, recording audio, setting up lights for us. And we're just kind of watching and trying to coach them through live. And that's been, a really incredible and eye-opening experience um, being a set producer who typically know, you know, we know everything when we get there and these people know nothing and they, they shot a broadcast spot for us in, in a day. So it, that was really neat. Wow. And sounds incredibly complicated. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. We definitely, we built some strong relationships throughout that shoot day with our clients and, you know, as an agency team, just working through all of the, the complications and, and teaching somebody how to have a shoot. That's really interesting. So, so are you guys finding that you're talking to the artists that are at the, um, the, the photographers and um, your vendors earlier in the process so that they can be part of the concepting, like what's feasible? I'd love to go to Kwame on that. Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, especially with how, how everything's gone back and forth and state by state, like who's working and who isn't. I mean, a lot of times you just pick up the phone or text someone and say, Hey, are you available to shoot? But it's changed a little bit there. And then you, so you, so you need a little bit more lead time in terms of, you know, are you near your equipment or do you have that stuff at home now? Do you have to go get it somewhere? Is it at your studio? Like how do we make all that logistical parts of it work? Um, but I, I wouldn't say like an extraordinarily long lead time as compared to before, but I definitely, I think we're reaching out a little bit sooner just to make sure we have all the pieces before we start making plans for where they're all going to go. Clarissa, I noticed you were really nodding when I asked that question. Can you comment too? Yeah, sorry, I'm in the chat. I love no, a good no. chat. <laughs> oh, is there a chat happening? There is a whole chat happening. All I'm right, I need to look at that. <laughs> um, Sorry, the question was. Oh, I oh, so you weren't nodding at us. <laughs> I was nodding at the chat. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, no, my question was I knew about. I was going to mess this up. Are, no, it's okay. Are, there's a lot of moving parts, but um, uh, the question was: Are you finding that the artists or the photographers are getting involved earlier in the process? Oh. 
that are being concepted as opposed yes. to, you know, oh, so, okay. Yeah, no, we, we've actually decided that we are holding now two pre-pros. So there's, and typically we do, we do an internal pre-pro and then we do an actual pre-pro that are client facing, but we've introduced this like artist pre-pro. So at the top of a project, we all come together as a team of creatives and production to talk about the best way forward. And the artist is, is able to give their ideas on how to execute an idea and not just us kind of trying to figure it out on our own. And so I feel like there's been some super innovative things that we've come up with. Um, in one call, we discovered that our photographer's best friend is a production stylist and had a house that was like super 60s and perfect for our location and really added to the project overall because we had that conversation up front. And so I think that's very that's a very popular way to handle things at this time because really aid, as in the agency, we don't have insight into what all of their resources are. I think that's my one thing that I is so important for photographers is to really pull on all of the resources in their like bubble <laughs> and bring those to the table um, to make Can things very that? successful right now. Can I ask for clarity? Are you, are you doing that with artists prior to making the decision of which uh, photographer you're going with? No, typically we, at, at 72, we're very creative. And so I think the process of choosing artists has not really shifted. It's based on your, your portfolio, your uh, creative call, you know, these things haven't really shifted for us. I'd say during the creative call, sometimes artists are talking through their ideas initially on how they would execute, but we really do hold a very uh, intensive meeting about that um, in sort of lieu of the treatment. I mean, we, and I know that that's a question on the list, but in yes. lieu of a treatment, we're having conversations about the best way to execute ideas. And I feel like I cut you off, Heather. Can you go? Uh, I just want to add that it's, it's kind of echoing what everyone else is saying here. What I'm finding on my end is that two things. One, as a, as a rep, I'm getting so many more calls as a resource because people are wondering, how do we do this first? So I'm getting that phone call and I'm you know, helping educate and explain and point them in the right direction. And then from a feasibility point of view, um, I'm finding we're having, you know, multiple calls before we can even create a bid. And everyone's really appreciating that process because the collaborative spirit that is involved in that is enormous. So whereas the first creative call used to be like, okay, take me through your shot list. Okay, temperature check. We're all, no pun intended there, but like, we all like each other. Okay, this was a good call. Now it's take me through your sh shot list. Okay, give me a minute now. I need to go and think. I need to go talk to all the people I know. I want to check in with all the, you know, um, get everybody else's opinion on my crew on how to do this. And then let me come back to you with some more ideas and some thoughts on how to do it. And I'm finding that um, it's become very valuable for photographers and directors to um, also showcase what they have access to. And, and I'm not just talking about like creating from home or anything like that. I mean, just who are the people in your world that can help you beyond your crew, maybe, that can help you solve this creative problem. Um, and it just requires a little bit more time. And I think the photographers are very appreciative of that time and being able to give more of their opinion um, earlier on in the process. I, thank you for that, Heather, because I was seeing you and I felt like I had cut you off. I apologize That's for that. Okay. Um, and so, you know, you're saying, Clarissa, you were just saying it's taking the place of treatment. So it really does take me to that next question. And I wanted to go to Madison. Um, are you noticing changes in treatments as well? Or um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think the, the last couple shoots, um, you know, as much as the creative is important, everyone on, on my side wants to know, well, do they have experience? How are they going to handle the technical side of it? Because I think people are still a little bit anxious about it. And, and that's proving to be more, 
more comforting in, in a treatment than like, I'll direct talent this way, or I'll, you know, I'll approach the lighting and the, the scenario this way. It's like, well, how are we going to see it happen? That's becoming more heavily weighted in treatments, at least right now. So that's proof of concept. Is that what we're talking about? Basically? Did Heather so raise her hand? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I was waving by somebody who's waving at me. <laughs> Oh, I know, yes. I know. <laughs> yes, you can go to the bathroom, Heather. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so proof of concept, is that what you're talking about, Madison? I guess not Not necessarily proof of concept, but just the what's in your toolbox, just like, you know, somebody else, I think it was Heather, like your network has become more valuable than your past experience with, you know, a, a typical production. I, I can jump in there too. Um, Another a separate video that we did for the building up for the season for the Jaguars. What, yeah, we were in the conceptual stage talking about there's a flag that they're giving away to season ticket holders for supporting the team. And it's a way to support the team from home. You wave the flag outside your house, hang it off your car, that kind of thing. Um, and we were trying to figure out, you know, how do we do this anthem video where the, the concept was you see this flag all over Jacksonville and you want to get one. Um, but clearly, yeah, we couldn't have a bunch of people running around, standing in front of people's houses and businesses, trying to get this flag set up. And while we were discussing it, literally one of the production guys, and this is where we're fortunate working with an NFL team that has their own distinct production team, he literally mounted one of the flags at the back of his pickup truck, set up a GoPro, and drove around Jacksonville for three hours and got every shot we needed. And here we are bickering on the phone, and he, came, he comes back and he's like, here's the raw footage, and that's what the spot was built from, and it was gorgeous. So again, it's like, how resourceful are you? And he's like, yeah, I literally just put the pole on my car before the season for tailgating for exactly that purpose. And it worked out perfectly. So yeah, to, to that point, it, it, you never know what people have, what they have access to. And you're going to get these ideas from the, the oddest places. Like, yeah, this is just a very tactical camera guy. And he's like, I'm going to go do this. And he got it done. That's interesting. So, so I wanted to move on to the next question. So what conversations are you having with your clients about productions? Have their expectations changed and what can about what can and cannot be done on set? Can I go to Sabrina for this one? Sure. Um, you know, it's I think it's part of our job now to educate our clients of what can and cannot be done. Um, as, as the same with our teams, you know, some people, you know, may have their head in the sand and they just want things to come back to normal and they want to fly to LA and they want to have a great shoot. Um, we need to let them know, you know, what are I don't like to say limitations are, but what, you know, what the new way of doing it is, you know, and I've always said, you know, it's not, it's, I'm not saying no, I'm saying, you know, you know what, we can do it this way. So, you know, it's our job to let our clients know, you know, the, the limits on the set, um, you know, how many people are allowed on set, um, the limits to the production. It's not, you know, a beautiful, glamorous, fun time, you know, anymore. You know, you have to wear a mask all the time. You are limited to a certain area. Um, you know, catering is limited. There's no great coffee runs, you know, the big production dinners, you know, wrap dinners at the end, you know, we, we can't do that, but we can do it a new way. Um, we also have to educate them, you know, what, with, you know, what our limitations are, you know, insurance has become a big deal. Um, and, you know, we're learning again, more and more every day from when I started, you know, the paperwork and the language has changed so much in the past six months. Um, but we, may, we need to make sure, you know, they need to know what they're covered for, what the agency is covered for, and what the photographer and crew are covered for, and how we're trying to do that in our, you know, in the best way possible. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, it's an education, you know, that we're learning every day, just, you know, we just have to be open, and I want them to be open, because we can do great productions, we are doing great productions, they're just not done in a traditional way, this is the new way of doing it, and it may go back, you know, you know, in, in two years, in, in two months, I don't know. Um, but this is the way we're doing it now and we're doing it and we're doing it great. Are they understanding in terms of timing and costs, like things are taking longer and that there's increase in costs and so on? I mean, um, no, it's a tricky question. Yeah, the timing, you know, ideal now, I'd like, you know, whereas we could do, you know, let's say a print shoot um, anywhere from like, you know, a great thing, you know, to do it, you know, in two weeks, you know, if we had two to six weeks in a traditional time, now I want six to eight weeks really built in. But in the beginning, they were willing to do that because everything was so slow moving. But now they're starting to see that we're producing and they want it done faster. 
So we're moving faster as well. Um, but we, we are saying, you know, if we want to do it faster like that, decisions have to make, be made more quickly. Um, we can't make all those decisions on set that we normally used to do. Um, we want wardrobe wrapped up before we get on set. We want props wrapped up before we get on set because our day is a little shorter. We don't want to go into heavy overtime. We don't want to stress the talent, the crew, the photographer, anyone. Um, so it, it, it's an education for that as well because, and, and budget wise, I think they're understanding. I mean, you know, people, you know, I'm finding clients are more open. They understand, you know, we need to take precautions and they're willing, you know, I found that they're willing to, you know, um, budget for those precautions. I haven't had any pushback on that yet. Madison, would you agree with that? Uh, I, yes and no. Um, I agree with everything. You know, we need to see things ahead of time because I'm experiencing a lot more uh, lag on set where, you know, we have to sanitize and we can't have two talent in the same wardrobe at the same time. And then we have to recycle the makeup kits and reset everything. So I think to that point, the, the shoot days do feel shorter only because you your time is so limited. Like even with you can't have talent interacting for more than 15 minutes at a time without their mask on. So everything's just compressed because there's other longer prep needed. And budgets? Um, my, it, I mean, I feel like things have gone down in the way like the coffee runs, the, the crafty, all that stuff is now, you don't put it in your budget. So that kind of evens out all the other things that would cause it to go up. I get you. And you know, I remember in the beginning, sorry, Heidi, everyone was really nervous about clients will, being willing to pay for the PPE and all the extra sanitizing and, you know, they're just people worried. And I'm finding whether I'm working on a job that has a very robust and healthy budget, or I'm working on a job that has a very, you know, we have to be really extra resourceful and they don't have enough money, but we're still trying to make it work. Either one of those jobs, no one is really willing to cut that or, I mean, no one will cut that, but, and the clients are willing to pay for that. So when you ask about budget, um, I think everyone thought our budgets were going to like skyrocket because of that. But, you know, as Madison said, there are things that are coming out that we wouldn't, didn't have before. And, um, and we're, we now know what the costs are involved with keeping a sanitized set. So, um, and they're pretty standard wherever you're shooting. Yeah. I think, I don't think anyone wants to argue. They want it to be safe. They want to, whatever we need to, yeah. to make that happen. Everyone has been really understanding, which has been great. That is great. So I wanted to go to Clarissa with my next question. Um, are you finding, um, are you trying out new people or are you trying, are you kind of sticking with people that you've used in the past? Um, are you finding yourself, you know, thinking out of the box and, and trying new people or, or it, can you speak to that for me? Um, that, I think that, I think that depends on what kinds of clients you're working on. Typically 72, we don't really have like go-to people we use all the time. Every idea is bespoke and demands a different level of talent or a different need for talent. Um, I don't, I don't, I looked at who I hired last year and I hired 30 people who were very different across several projects. So we, we never really worked in the way that like if you have a, maybe a food client and you just have this one go-to team. We don't really work in that way. Um, I think our creatives are demanding of us to always be looking for a different aesthetic per project, so. Kwame, would you agree with that or do, do you have a different? No, I agree, absolutely. I mean, I think it, it as Clarissa said, it, it's always gonna depend on what the idea is, what you're trying to execute on and who, who the best talent that's available at the moment is whether it's your your you're behind the camera, your 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 talent in front of the camera, and yeah, we we kind of are built the same way where it's like it's really going to come down to what that script demands and what the client's expectations are, and then we kind of go out and source it from there. On the flip side of it, we haven't had an issue with sourcing you know any talent at all. Like availability has not been as limited as we would have thought. Um, everybody wants to work, everybody's willing to work, and again, it goes back to that how creative are we gonna be and how we get it done in terms of making sure everyone's safe, but at the same time, everyone's getting it done to the expectations of both us and the client. So from that standpoint, yeah, if the, if the talent's available and they're willing to do, jump through the couple little extra hoops that we might have in, in, on the production side, 
then we're, we're ready to work with them. Can well, I just add one note? Oh, please. Yeah, I, I, and I agree with that. I do think that what has changed, and I'm just going to point this out, not to get political, but clients are really looking for a diverse and inclusive artist at this point right now. I mean, I've spent the last two months working with more Latinx and Black artists than I ever have in my entire career. It's heartwarming for me personally, but I think if there is one note of what has changed looking for artists, that has been a major shift. And I think just on my little soapbox, I think that all of us should be looking for to hire and mentor those types of artists at this time, because I don't think that that's going to change or shift going forward. It's going to be a new normal to have a more diverse group in your bidding circle. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I totally agree. Sabrina, would you agree with that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think it's fantastic because we're definitely opening the doors and like Clarissa said, mentoring more people. Um, right now, I'm not looking for someone that I've worked with before necessarily. I'm looking for someone who can do the job well. Um, and, and that's a great thing. And the clients have been receptive to that and the agency and, you know, teams have been receptive to that. So um, we're, you know, ready to open any doors that are possible. Um, a lot of our groups have, you know, put together lists of vendors and everything, um, you know, diverse vendors. So I, I think it's great now that we're able to, you know, open the doors to all those different um, people to come, you know, work and it's better than ever. I will add one other note. Yeah. Um, in terms of something being a little bit different, clients are a lot more open to local talent where they are, as opposed to, you know, obviously like Serena was saying before, flying out to LA or New York and even up in Vancouver and stuff like that to do the shoots there, that that's been a huge open door for local shooters, local camera guys, yeah. all that local talent that otherwise wouldn't even have a shot because they're not in a major market, but they just happen to be in the right place at the right time. Like, yeah, if we're shooting in Pittsburgh, you know, that's not New York or LA, but guess what? There are a lot of people there that are very talented. I would agree. Yeah. That um, so many of the calls that I get are very location specific. Do you have somebody in this city? Um, not just because they want, or, or also, sorry, let me correct that. It's not just for the city, but that is a big part of it. But also, can that person from that city travel to this, right? Because there's been restrictions from people from California can't go to New York unless they quarantine for two weeks, things like that. So where we used to try and pretend that they were from anywhere and you didn't want to kind of advertise or broadcast where the person was from. Now it's very important to know where that person is from. Madison, would you agree with that too? I would. I think um, it's allowing me to encourage my teams to branch out because I have people who are like, I only want to shoot with people in LA or I only want like, oh, they're not from New York. They're not going to be able to do what we need them to do. And it's like, there is a, a bigger pool of resources that I think a lot of people have been hesitant to tap into until now because they have to. And, and it's, it's really shining a light on the fact that there's great resources and talent everywhere. And so I'm enjoying that a lot. <laughs> well, that sort of brings me to my next question. Since it's not um, possible to have in-person meetings with reps and vendors, how are you viewing new work? Are you relying on email blasts? Have you received any mailers? Um, I, I kind of want to go to Sabrina right now. Sure. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of email blasts and I think now more than ever, I'm going through them um, a lot more because they're giving us the details of how they can do it, um, whether it's create in place or where they're located or, you know, um, all, you know, what, what resources they've come up with. And I've actually reached out to photographers and agents who've sent me things that have piqued my interest and say, I want to discuss more how you're doing this. How did you know? How did you do this production? What are you thinking of and everything? Because I need problem solvers right now. Um, that's the most important thing. And we, I've reached out photographers that I have used in the past that were not ready to shoot in COVID. They hadn't, you know, thought ahead of what needs to be done. Um, so I'm relying more and more on the email blasts. Um, you know, mailers, they're they're not coming to my house anymore. Um, but you know, mailers, I just don't have, you know, the, the the space for necessarily. I, I really love the email blast. I love, you know, hearing the updates, you know, looking at the different um, social media and everything and see what everyone's doing. And I'm spending personally more time looking into it and finding vendors through that as well. So there's a question that came in on the Q&A. It says, um, oh, wait a minute, it went away. 
Where, how did that happen? No, it went over to answer. Just check the answer. I, I, oh, you yeah. okay. So, so <laughs> you answered it. And one of them is for you, Heather, actually. Um, but I guess you just answered it. Uh, I don't need to go to it if you did, but the, the question was about um, should local photographers be super, you know, doing big pushes to bigger agencies that they maybe never really reached to before because of the things that you guys just said, I think <laughs> this is really the question at hand. I think I answered it. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You should. 100%. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I said in the chat. I'm like, all of a sudden your locality is a strength. And if they didn't know you existed before, this is the perfect time to let them know because with the travel restrictions, with people, and even when it's not restricted, people that aren't willing to travel, it's like, oh, I'm not getting on a plane right now. If you got a local shooter who's knocking on your door, give them a shot. Exactly. Okay. Really fair. Okay, so so you're relying on e-blasts. Have you um, seen any unique ways in which reps or artists are staying connected with you to show you new work? I'm gonna go to Madison. I think, um, one of my very good friends, I don't know if she's on here or not, but um, she became a rep recently and has started doing little like video interviews with her artists and sending those out and, and promoting them as a way to, it's, you know, it's like a, a short little two minute thing that you can watch and we read email all day. So it is kind of exhausting sometimes admittedly to have to read through like an update of somebody who did a cool project. Like, of course I want to know, but I also have to deal with the 500 emails that our work things and draining. So she started doing these little videos of like, hey, I'm I'm photographer X and this is kind of what I've been up to and here's a little bit about me and my house and my dog and my whatever. And it's just a really nice way to, to get to know somebody without any pressure of a creative call or an impending job. All right, um, so um, portfolio shows and presentations, you know, obviously those are not really happening in agencies right now or in your, your spaces right now. Are, are you doing any of them in sort of in this sphere, in this structure, like in, in the Zoom space? You know, um, not to talk about workbook, but we do a portfolio event where we set up meetings and so on. Are you guys participating in things like that? Are reps, you know, reaching out to you to, to have, you know, like Zoom meetings and things like that? Um, I'm going to, Clarissa, you're nodding and I need to hear what you have to say. <laughs> well, yeah, I've participated in several of them um, for APA and recently, and then also um, photographer Matthew, oh dear, can't remember his last name, but he put together a portfolio show with Cecily Chambers for all of the up and coming BIPOC artists um, throughout the country. And I thought it was fantastic. I met some amazing artists through that. And so I think it's really difficult to do one-on-ones right now. I don't know about you guys, but my schedule is so booked, jam-packed with Zoom meetings daily. I, I can't do one-on-ones with artists. So when I do have a rep or someone reach out to me about a show, I'm the first one to sign up. I love doing them. I'm like a one-on-one -on -one type of person. And if I can do a breakout room with like three photographers, that's the sweet spot, you know? <laughs> that's when you really get to know a person in their work. So I hope we can do more of that um, because it's uh, really valuable. And I, I'm happy to take a Saturday morning and do that. And do you see these meetings coming back at some point? Not, I don't think we can do them virtually, honestly, like, I look at my calendar and even if I wanted to set up a one-on-one -on -one with someone, it's just, I don't know, I, I get pings all day and meetings added throughout the day. And then I'll have to inevitably cancel on that person because some production meeting is happening. I mean, literally everything that used to happen inside the agency is now happening on the calendar via Zoom. And it's, so it's just, I'm finding it impossible to set up one-on-one uh, -on -one reviews with artists. I think once we go back into traditional working from the office, we can address that and do that in our downtimes, but I haven't been able to do it. <laughs> I would <laughs> add that being the rep that's trying to stay relevant and stay connected to all of you, um, getting a meeting is, is non-existent. I mean, not non-existent, but it's just, it's really challenging. and. Frankly, I've kind of stopped asking for those kind of meetings. And what I'm doing instead is trying to provide value um, 
or a resource of some sort. Um, because I find that if I were to call you, Clarissa, and ask if I can, you know, have a few minutes of your time to show you somebody's work, that just kind of shows that I'm I'm a little tone deaf to what you have going on right now. Like you could go on a website and check out the work very easily. So unless I'm going to be showing you something so different or sharing something with you that would be a strong resource that you need, um, you probably won't have the time to engage. So I'm really trying to think about what are those resources and how can I be helpful um, or be of value to you rather than, you know, asking for something from you, like time, which is the last thing any of us have. Yeah. I will say that I now respond to rep newsletters and emails, which I was really <laughs> bad about that ahead of the <laughs> pandemic, but now I'll just like, great work. So glad to hear from you. You know, I do that <laughs> now and everyone's like, whoa, she's responding to my newsletter. And it's like, well, I mean, how else are we going to talk? You know, <laughs> so. <laughs> that's I interesting. I miss coming to your agencies. That's the worst part. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that line, how else are we going to talk? I mean, that's really the question at hand. Like, so, you know, how else are we going to talk? And so those portfolio events, like you were mentioning, and Heather reaching out in that way is great. Kwame, would you like maybe, you know, chime in here a little bit? Sure. Um, again, since our, the way our agency is set up, we kind of always did everything virtually. Um, so yeah, we, we, we've done a few of those portfolio shows and it's, it's great, especially to be able to see the work live. Like we, for another client, we were doing um, infographics and motion graphics and illustration and animation and stuff. And we were able to actually see some of the people working live with the, like we gave them like a little description of what we were thinking and watching them live work on it. Oh, it might work like this and it might work like that. And almost like seeing animatics come to life while you're talking to them and you have three artists working on it at once and it was like a little bit of competition but a little bit of collaboration and it was great to see how their thought process works right there almost in a way that you wouldn't see in a traditional you know stop by and look so yeah it's been it's been really unique that way and I think it's yeah I mean I hate the phrase new normal but I think that's part of what that's going to be is I mean technology was already moving into that space before the pandemic and I think like Madison was saying earlier, it opens up a whole new world of talent and resources and availability once you open that door. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. I think we're only gonna see that expand. Fair enough. And so my next question is really about Zoom fatigue, which I almost feel like it's a silly question because we all, I have Zoom fatigue. Madison, like, do you get, like you're all talking about being on these Zooms all day long and you know, finding the time to do meetings up on top of that, it, does that stop you from, from, you know, creating more meetings and things like that? Madison? I think at first everyone was super excited. Like, we're home. We can just video chat all the time. And now everyone refuses to be on camera. We're all tired. We don't want to, we don't want to do it anymore. And I think it is hard not being at the agency and being able to run around and, and have those quick conversations. Now it's like we have to set up a, a Zoom meeting and it's a lot more talking than doing yeah. until we get to actually do something. So it, it is tiring, admittedly. I've been trying to um, make them phone calls again and actually go for a walk um, instead of being at my desk in front of my computer, distracted by email or, you know, thinking that I should be on email and I'm not, I'm on this call. Um, and I don't get to do it very often, but when I do, I'm so appreciative that I've actually gotten outside of the house, so. Fair enough. Uh, Sabrina, do you agree with all of that? Yeah, I do. I mean, I find that um, we use teams at our agency and, you know, I do miss going around the agency and just stepping into my, you know, creative director's office and saying, you know, let's chat for a few minutes about this. But I can also just, you know, ping them that way, and they've been very responsive. Um, I, I think, you know, we're getting used to it. This is the new normal. Um, you know, this is the way to do it. Um, I'm actually enjoying it more. Um, I find with productions, I'm having a lot more meetings with producers and photographers and everything over Zoom, over Teams, and things like that. And I think it's helpful um, for everyone to see. I, I don't have so much fatigue anymore, except for like a shoot day where you're, you know, 12 hours in front of the screen, which is yeah. really mentally and physically exhausting. Um, however, you know, I, I think it's, you know, 
I like seeing the photographers, you know, meeting them up front where we never, you know, used to be able to, used to just be a phone call um, and putting a name to the face and seeing the producers and everything. I'm, I'm actually enjoying that. And I think it's, you know, helping our relationships even more. And, you know, we're very, you know, I love seeing, you know, Madison's dog there or someone's, you know, kid no, pop, right? everything. It's, it's real life too. So we get to, you know, a sneak peek as well. Um, you, I, I find with the, when we were talking about um, the portfolio reviews, I found that the Zoom portfolio reviews when it's a big group was difficult because so many people are trying to talk. Um, so I think, you know, it's better. Um, I, I like um, what Clarissa was saying that people were doing breakout rooms and everything. I haven't experienced that before, but I think, you know, we just need to find better ways to make it happen where it's not so um, uh, too much information at once. Well, I, not that what I'm saying matters, but I find myself, I love the, um, I love phone calls, always have, but when I'm not on Zoom, there's so many things that you can do, like in terms of sharing your screen and showing different stuff. And that is like uh, having a regular phone call is now like weird to me, I think. <laughs> um, it's like, wait a minute, I don't get to see your face. And, and like, I mean, I find that to be, so I get Zoom fatigue just like everybody else. Um, when you have an entire day of Zooming. But in the same sentence, I'm now like really reliant on it. So that's sort of where I was going to go with like, even when we have a vaccine and we're back at work fully, how do you think experiences that we've all shared to date will affect the future of marketing? So like for me, I'm never going to, I don't think, give up this getting to see people when they're so far away. Like this makes me happy. You know what I mean? But, you know, how do you see some of the changes that have happened because of you know, logistics, like how do you see that changing the future of communications in this regard, but also marketing in general? Um, I, I kind of want to go to uh, Kwame on that. Sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely going to change everything. And I think people are more set up for it now. People understand, you know, what it takes to make it happen where, you know, the, the, the whole idea of working from home has always been rife with suspicion and squishiness. And it's like, are you really working from home? Are you really going to be on this call? And to go back to the previous question, it, it being on Zoom, outside of any fatigue that might happen, it forces you to focus, especially when you are on camera, especially when you're in a group of people, everybody can see what you're doing. And as opposed to, you know, working from home, when you're just using the phone, you're wandering around with your phone, when you're on a call, you're making a sandwich, you're kind of watching TV, like there are other things going on, and you're not always fully engaged. Um, so I think from, in, from that respect, I think even after the pandemic is over, hopefully, um, you'll see a lot more requests for this kind of communication as opposed to let's just hop on the phone real quick because you want to see the reactions and you want to be able to share your screen and it's a lot easier than saying, all right, as soon as I get up this call, I'm going to send you the document and then you can comment on it and send it back. And We can do all that right now. So I think that's from a productivity standpoint, from a ease, ease standpoint, it's just going to be easier for everyone to do some of this stuff this way. And I think that's one of the upsides of the pandemic is it's that it's forced people who are resistant to it, forced people who never downloaded Zoom before this pandemic started to actually see what it's like and get used to it. So when we're, we are on the other side of it, you're going to have a bunch of new people that are already trained on it, already ready to do it, already have their rooms set up beautifully like we all do to have these calls. Yeah. No, the multitasking, I love that you mentioned the multitasking because there. I feel like we've all been in a Zoom call where somebody's doing something and you're like, what is happening exactly right now? <laughs> you know, you know whether it's adjusting something and coming too close to the camera or whatever, you're like, what is happening over there? But I have to say, I agree with you about Madison. I love seeing that dog on the couch. I wish he'd come back. Um, so I, I want to get into some of the questions that came, um, you know, through uh, the registration process. Are you noticing significant changes in budgets? We already talked about that. Are you okay getting email promos at this time? We talked about that too. Um, curious about printed promos, talked about that. Um, how are producers and clients addressing liability for potential COVID issues arising on and off and or after productions? Thanks. We talked about this a little bit. We didn't really get into it deeper. I was wondering, Sabrina, would you jump into that? Sure. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to work together with our vendors, with our clients, um, and with our legal team. And, you know, as I said, you know, insurance at this time is not covering um, any cancellations or postponements due to COVID. Um, so I think it goes hand in hand with the way production is hand, handling it. We need to make our clients aware, you know, that, you know, it's not covered. We are taking a, a risk, you know, if someone gets sick. Um, but at the same time, we are doing everything in our power 
to make sure no one gets sick. Um, and, you know, we've learned so much in the past six months on how to do that. And, and you know, there's always new, you know, innovations coming through with that. Um, the sanitizing of the sets, the wearing the masks, you know, the, the special kits, you know, we're not keeping wardrobe, all those things. Um, so, you know, I think until, you know, and, and hopefully this doesn't happen, you know, in, until somebody, you know, finally calls out, you know, a production or something and says, I got sick, you know, from them. And, and you know, if that blows up, that's going to be a huge issue for us. But, you know, we haven't seen this. Movies are going back into production. You know, TV shows are going back into production. We're all back in production. And I think everyone's realizing, you know, we, we just have to do what our best to stay safe. And if you don't feel comfortable on set, and I've, I've had issues with, you know, teams have come back on and then, you know, we've lost people because they're like, you know what, I'm not ready. There's too many people here. I don't feel comfortable. So you have to do what's right for you. And you have to say to that crew member, I understand, you know what, thank you for your time and everything. But I, I think this has all forced us to, you know, listen to everyone and not question them and not put pressure on them. Um, you know, in, in talent as well, we were so excited that talent is, you know, we've had great castings, talent is ready to come back. But at the same time, we make them aware of everything and make sure, you know, are you okay with this? This is the way we're going to do it. And we've had talent thank us and tell us that our sets have been really safe. They felt great. They felt comfortable, you know, not wood and everything. So, you know, we're, we're doing the best possible. We have not rushed into anything. Um, it's been baby steps all the way. And I think, you know, it, we're just learning more how these productions can be safer and better every time. I hope we don't lose um, site that we need to continue it and not just get into a comfortable zone. We need to continue the safety protocols um, that we're all doing because it's making a difference and it's, it's, we're able to keep our jobs. Really good answer. <laughs> really good answer. Honestly, I'm just, that's one of the things I love about this panel is that I learned so much, but um, I, I wanted to ask the next question. How do you deal with last minute shoot cancellations due to COVID? Are there any kill fees for crews? Is that in your contracts? I wanted to go to Madison. We, we really haven't changed our policies um, because of the whole, you know, insurance isn't covering it. It doesn't really, you know, it's out of our control, whatever. Um, we're just kind of following AICP standard guidelines at this point and within a certain number of business days for whatever reason it, You get killed fees. It's just what it is. Nothing's changed in that regard You're still taking away if we're, you know, if we're canceling the shoot for client reasons um, That's not an excuse not to give people money. They, there's the jobs are out there. They're losing opportunity for income. So um, It's it's been really helpful to have account teams level set with our clients before we award a job and say, listen, even though something could happen, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to step in that for a second. We've had um, not cancellations, but we've lost talent also um, days before, you know, whether they were in a red state all of a sudden and they couldn't come over or, you know, they, they had to leave or something. We've, you know, a new thing we've set up is that we always have backup talent. We cast backup talent for all our roles. We, we provide, you know, we had double wardrobe for all our roles and everything because that has been a very real thing. Um, and that's one of the things we had to educate the client on as well, that we have to, um, you know, have this in our budget because it's, it's really happened. I've had talent, you know, three days before a shoot saying, you know, they're stuck in another state. And I'm like, I can't have you come three days before this is going to be, you know, this is going to cause a problem. Could I have snuck her in? I, I guess, but I would never do that to my crew or my agency or anyone else on there. It's, you know, like, I, as I said before, you have to think ahead of, you know, how to protect everyone overall. And, and the talent have understood, but you know what, that talent still gets paid because, you know, they were willing to come in, they were supposed to come in and something happened. Yeah, plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, yeah. right? So what, are we up to L, M, N, O? For your backups. Right, so, I mean, that's fascinating. So, um, you know, I don't know if anybody knows how to answer this question, but it was certainly asked, how do you think that the outcome of the election may affect our industry? I, I, I wouldn't even begin to know how to answer that question, but I love that Clarissa just made a face, so I'm gonna go to her with this question. <laughs> um, but honestly, is there really an answer to this? I, I, I don't even know. So feel free to say, let's move on. That was just my no politics face. <laughs> I just, uh, I, I I'm not, not touching that one. I, I actually, I just put my 10 foot pole away. So sorry. Yeah. I can't do it. yeah, no, fair enough. And Heather, honestly, I would like to see your shirt. Like show us your shirt. It says November is coming. That's right. It is. But honestly, <laughs> I think that's a, 
you know, there's, I don't know if there, there's a way to answer that, to be honest with you. So I'm going to move on on that part. Well, look, actually, I, I can add something to that. Okay. You know, I've been a rep through many election cycles and I've had conversations with photographers around election years all the time. And I do think brands hold back in election years right around election. So regardless of, I know the question was, the intention was what happens depending on who wins the election. No, no one really will know that. But I do know that historically there is a different, there are things that just don't get done because brands are waiting to see what will happen in an election. So regardless of your politics, um, I do think the election affects what money is being spent either way. I have to say, I think that is a fantastic answer. <laughs> no, and it's also true. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, that helps, right? But I think that that was a really smart, because that matters. Um, so I want to go to Kwame with a question. How has creative shifted with the pandemic? It's kind of broad. Yeah, it is kind of broad. Um, I think, like I said at the top of the, the, the webinar, it's forced us as creative people to embrace that creativity in different ways where it's not just coming up with a concept or a script or whatever else it's how do we actually execute on this stuff with all these restrictions and changing guidelines and location-based things and all these other factors that are now coming into play it's forced us to have to think differently about how we create the work and and, and even how the work is distributed um yeah i mean we're not we're not doing a lot of you know, guerrilla on the street marketing because there aren't a lot of people on the streets to see it. Like who's going to pay for a giant billboard campaign at this time? Not a lot of people. So then what do we do with that? How do we make that work? Does that then turn into more Facebook ads or more Instagram or something like that where we know where people are? I mean, people are scrolling the length of the Empire State Building every day with their thumbs. We got to fit in there somewhere. Like, so it's really embracing what the situation is and kind of taking that step back and going, all right, how do we take our ideas and creatively approach it? So, Clarissa, I believe that you needed to leave at exactly 12. Is that correct? That meeting actually just got canceled, so. Well, awesome. <laughs> you got well, me. Maybe, maybe not, but good for me. Um, uh, so we just have a few more before we're, we're done, so I'm super glad to hear that. Wait, um, can I interject for a second and dra draft off of what was just said? Um, I've been thinking this whole podcast about the people who are listening in. Um, and I know because it's the workbook and Dear Art Producer, a lot of the people who listen in are photographers and directors and illustrators. And, um, and I've heard you all talk about, obviously the last question was how has creative changed? Um, but I've heard all of you talk about how busy you are at production. And obviously because the creative has changed, we're using more user generated content. You're using more of your, you're having your patients do the videoing or the taking their own photos or whatever it is that, that we're doing, the, the creative has obviously changed. What would you say to the photographers out there who, I mean, they're not as busy and the directors and, you know, they're not as busy as they used to because we would, it used to have a lot of your, of your attention. And now your attention is being put towards other types of production. Um, and those photographers, you know, also are getting, not getting called because they're not in the city that you need you know there's so many reasons they used to be called just for their work and now there's so many other reasons why they're not getting calls do you have any advice for the people out there who are slower than they used to be or are you know looking to drum up business and haven't been able to and i know it's a hard question but um it goes along i think with that creative you know creative has changed so as a vendor you know, they want to stay relevant. What, what advice would you have for them? I can jump in there. Cause I, I mean, in addition to being used to for bravely, I'm also a freelance copywriter. So I know that, that, that gig side of it as well. And a lot of what I've done is really, I mean, it's not the best answer, but a lot of it is volunteer and pro bono work and reaching out to local businesses, like smaller businesses that you probably wouldn't have talked to before the yeah. pandemic. Like I'm, I'm literally helping a local pizza place run their Instagram now because they never had one, but they had to shift their whole model once people weren't coming to the dining room. It's like, well, how do we tell people about our specials? And how do we tell, like, I mean, we're doing everything from menu features to features about their their workers there just because we can. But, you know, it's again, as a copywriter, it's not really a job I would have taken on a year ago, but 
it's local and I can talk to them easily. And if I really have to pop over, it's five minutes away and I throw my mask on, I can help them out. Well, it's but probably it's positive that, for you too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, if, so if you, you know, my answer has always been in, in the ups and downs of my freelance career is like, go local, go back to your community. You'll always find something there to do. I ended up on the board of the local little league redesigning their logo and doing all and redoing their website for them because I was during a down period. So it, it, it can happen there. And, and, and again, it's not the best answer because you're not necessarily always getting paid, but at least you're, you're getting work done. You're building your portfolio. You're doing something to keep things moving. Great. I see closer. You're, you're nodding. Do you have any yeah. advice on this? Yeah, I would say, honestly, a couple of things. If we're just talking about being relevant, I think more than ever, we're doing a lot of licensing that hasn't let up for me. I, even in the midst of doing shoot productions, I'm on two licensing projects. So if, if photographers can put together a batch of images that, that are good for licensing and send me a Dropbox, I'll take a look. I've had several people do that and it's been very helpful to me. So licensing content is king in this moment. The second thing I'll say is, again, about relevancy. I think if you have any Black people or Latinx people in your library, I should I should see that at this moment. All of my work, like I said, for the past two months have been diversity and inclusive inclusion briefs. And so I have found it extremely difficult to find um, artists of color. It's just been very difficult. And so if you are an artist of color, you need to let me know that you are because I go on websites it's sometimes it's difficult for me to de even determine that. And I know, I don't know how to say how to position yourself, but introduce yourself as a person of color and tell me about who you are, because that's gonna help me understand where you're coming from and what you're going to bring to the project and how that can support our inclusion brief currently on the table. I'm yeah. just being honest. Yeah. Because that is relevant in this moment and it, it's important to talk about. Madison, do you have advice in this regard? Because I have to be honest, I, this is a much better question than I had on my paper. So I really do want to hear everybody's answer. So thanks for that one, Heather. Really, really good. Um, Madison, could you could you uh, maybe speak to some advice for, you know, people who want to work and, and want to get to you and yeah. all of those things? Yeah, and I, I do apologize. I After this, I will step off. So it was nice being here. Um, I, I've been telling people to really use this time to expand on their personal portfolios and, and reevaluate because, you know, I think creative is changing a lot and we need to look at, you know, what, what was and wasn't working before might not even be the same as what will and will not work in the future. So this is a chance while you're not working. I know it's not ideal um, to spend your own personal money and time on per on developing your portfolio. But I think just getting out there and diving into our current surroundings and, and doing it for yourself. And just like Clarissa said, then sending us updates on those projects. Like, hey, I, I just, I, I went out and explored this. What do you think of it? How can I be better? And through that, you'll probably get work even. And, and I've had, just like Clarissa said, I had a few photographers do that and we ended up using it for a campaign because I was like, oh wait, they showed me their personal portfolio just asking for my thoughts on how they can adapt and, and be more current with how the world is changing. And I thought back to it and I was like, we could use that for a website and we did and we ended up paying them. So that, that also familiarized my creatives with this person's work. And another point that I will just say before um, getting off, I, again, to Clarissa's point, it's really hard to tell what what background you come from on on your website and now more than ever we want to be we want to diversify and, and and branch out from the typical white creative wash that has been our industry for so long but it's also i don't want to make anyone uncomfortable by saying well are what are you black are you latinx whatever i don't want i want it to be about your creative talent and your skill first and foremost so coming out and being open about it is really helpful because I want to look for that, but I also don't want to offend anybody or, or make it only about that because it's not about your skin color. It's you're talented. You're a talented person and I want talent and I, I want to offer it out to different communities too. So that's, that's, that's all I'll say. Right. 
and it's a great time not if, yeah even if you're not getting work like like Madison and Clarissa were saying it's a great time to start building those relationships because mm -hmm. something like Madison's example that, that kind of stuff happens all the time where like that person just happened to email you or get in touch with you a week or two ago right when you needed them for something and it, it, it works out serendip serendipitously and yeah I mean I, I, again from my own experience during those down times, even when no one has work for you, you still stay in touch and you keep that relationship going. And I think that's where you'll get a lot of those questions answered. Like, what's your background? How do you, how do you like to shoot? Where are you from? And it's because it's not necessarily about getting a job at that moment. It's just about opening that dialogue. Yeah. I'd love to. I got to jump guys, but so nice. Thank you so much, Heidi. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, not at all. And, and we're going to wrap up soon too. Thank you so much, Madison. You're the greatest. Um, uh, I did want to hear what Sabrina's thoughts were on this uh, a little bit. So, um, and then we'll move into our silver linings, which is, you know, the way I like to sort of end our broadcast each time. So Sabrina, would you, you know, t uh, comment on, on some advice for those listening, please? Sure. And I, I have to say, I really loved everyone's answer here because everyone had a different answer and a different way of approaching it. Um, you know, my way of approaching it is, you know, continue to do work and problem solve. Like I've said all along, I, I need you to think ahead of how are you going to shoot from now on? What do you need? Do you have a great streaming guy? Do you have the equipment? Um, have you tried it out? You know, what is working for you? Just, you know, just really, you know, it's, it's a time when if it's a downtime, use the time to learn, use this time to teach yourself something new. Um, you know, whether it benefits you, you know, just as a person or professionally and everything, just expand on everything that, you know, you're able to do. Um, I, you know, I, I really loved Kwame's thing about, you know, helping out local businesses and everything. And a lot of photographers have actually had done, you know, they're doing personal projects and they're sending it through. And it, it always puts a smile on my face because they're just, you know, they're continuing to be creative. So I, I need you to continue to be creative. I need you to think, you know, but I need you to be creative in these times as well and, and figure it out and, and put together great teams, start interviewing other people who, you know, may be able to be a part of your great crew um, and make it an easier production for everyone. That's a great answer. You guys are also very smart. I, I, I just can't thank you enough for being here today. Um, I always like to end these, you know, with a, um, you know, what's your silver linings? Um, I think I'm a Pollyanna at heart. I, I always, you know, even though, there's so much tragedy, you know, surrounding what we're all going through right now. Um, I do always like to think of the silver linings. What are we learning? What are we grateful for? So I'm just going to ask each of you, you know, to give me a, a little, what are your silver linings from all of this? Um, I'd love to start with Kwame. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with the pat answer first and then my real answer. The pat answer is, oh, I get to spend so much more time with my family. They're driving me insane. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, really, like my biggest silver lining is really the fact, and I'm a big pop culture geek, and, and the fact that drive-in movies have made a comeback is huge. Oh my god, that's so great. For, for my family, especially, like, you know, they get, even in a regular movie theater, you know, you don't get to talk, you don't get to interact with each other while the movie's going on, but that whole feeling of sit, the four of us sitting there in the car, watching the movie together, listening to it on this little radio I had to buy on eBay, because we didn't have a radio in the house anymore, but it's the, it's, it's just that there's a little bit of nostalgia there and like i mean i'm i'm not old enough to have even had a bunch of driving movies in my past but I, I went to a couple as a kid and i thought they were awesome so the fact that that's coming back it's 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 one of the few things that i'm really excited about and i hope that, that it continues even when theaters are able to fully open again that's a great answer i am old enough to have gone to a ton of driving movies in my past and i too am looking at there's one opening up in our area that we're excited about so I'm with you on that. Um, Clarissa? Uh, yeah, I'm with, I'm with Kwame, like spending so much time with my wonderful children. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get away from them. Um, so no, but my actual answer is I'm, I'm a singer and so I love music and I, I think every one of my favorite artists has dropped an album in this moment. Like there's so much amazing music that's come out of people just being at home and writing and singing and performing. So, and then there's like the verses on, in, in, on Instagram and you've got all these amazing artists going live. I just, that stuff feeds my soul and I love it. Like I'm, I'm here for it and I'm on every single one of those, those, uh, music outlets <laughs> um, online. So yeah, it's been great. A lot of personal private concerts. 
<laughs> oh, right. Um, okay, then Sabrina. Gosh, um, I have a teenager, so I never see her. So it's fine. <laughs> She's either just in her room. That's that's fine with me. Um, but you know what? I I'm finding that you know now that I'm used to like we're not going in the office anymore, and I, I miss you know my reading time on the train or or things like that. I've I've kind of taken back that time now, and I just signed up. And I'm putting it out there now that to do like a yoga teacher training. Um, and it just, it's helping me, you know, mentally, it's helping me physically. And it's giving me time. I'm forced to, you know, not work or not spend time with my family, whom I love. Um, but to do something for me, too, because I think, you know, when this all happened, you're just trying to do everything. Um, you know, you, you're trying to keep your house. You're trying to cook all those meals because, you know, you can't go out. Um, and there's not much to do. And I feel like, you know, a lot of us um, have just, you know, pushed ourselves by the wayside and, you know, we weren't taking advantage. So I, you know, I'm appreciating, you know, defining that time for myself and, you know, um, taking advantage of it um, as best I can. That's a great answer. I want to take your yoga class when you're ready. Um, <laughs> uh, Heather? You know, I've answered this so many times and it's really a great moment in the podcast or in the webinar to kind of sit and reflect in my like what I'm feeling at the exact moment. And listening to all of you talk today just reminded me, and I've said this before, but we literally are pioneers right now in our industry. And many of us have been in the industry for a very long time and have seen different changes happening. I just think we're on the precipice of something really big. Like whatever's gonna come next for us is being informed by what's happening right now. So I'm feeling very, you know, there's definitely a silver lining. I, I mean, I wouldn't have chosen it, but like, if I have to say, like being a part of how things are evolving and changing and being part of the conversations and getting to meet all these new people and talk to them about what they're doing and how they're problem solving. And that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, we'll get to look back on this and be like, I remember when <laughs> and we accomplished something pretty cool. So yeah, I, 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 I'm feeling that. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and as my child walks in at the last moment of the broadcast, looking for um, his chair, <laughs> made it this far. That was excellent. So my silver lining is is that he made it this far. Um, but also, I have to agree with you. I think the time right now is to be bold, and I'm feeling like. The more nimble we can be, the more bold we can be. And so I, I would agree with you about the silver lining. What I will say I resent the most is dishes. I'm, I'm starting to lose my mind about the amount of dishes that I am washing all the time. But that's negative and we want to end on a positive note. So um, I always say the same thing about my biggest silver lining. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> is that is the perfect ending. <laughs> That's it. Don't say anything else. You're done. <laughs> Mic drop. Mic drop. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> they are my silver linings, but really my, my <laughs> only silver lining is, is that we get to have these kinds of connections and I get to listen and learn from all of you guys. So I just want to say I'm super grateful for every one of you. Um, Madison too. And um, thank you. Just thank you so very much for taking your time today for um, being so darn smart. And um, this is a part where we wave goodbye and then I just hit the button. So bye everybody. Thank bye. you. Bye. See you later. Thank you, you all.